And on a related topic, and I think this is really your area, I mean, I think the issue is cost, and it might be one of the biggest you know, issues in terms of the cloud and generally, even Amazon. I mean, how do people manage cost, contain, how do they deal with ROI? I mean, how, how do they really deal with, with the cost issue of, of Amazon Web Services? And since you well, found a cloudability, I think this might be your area. Well, what I was talking about just now was it used to be that if you needed a faster disk, you couldn't buy it. Unfortunately, now you can and that can make it really expensive. Before, you had to solve the problem, you own the server, you couldn't change it, now you can, and that becomes very expensive very quickly. But beyond those first um, year new mistakes as you get your head around how to succeed on the cloud, the next problem becomes about redefining how you manage your spending and to stop thinking about it like a cost and start thinking about it like the return. When you're sitting on your knees in front of your CFO asking for five million bucks for a new Oracle rack cluster, there's a different approach to cost management than there is on the cloud where you can spend whatever you need to spend but you're accountable for every dollar of it and you better have a good argument for why you need to spend that much each and every month because the business is going to be on your back. And we find the most appropriate way, and this is a really big change and people are having a really hard time getting their head around it, is to decide first of all if your system is one that should have a fixed budget or one where the cost varies with your business. An example of a fixed budget would be an R&D cluster. One that varies with your business would be a web cluster. More users means more web pages, means more servers. And again, Netflix do this with their Sunday night spike and their Monday morning shutdown. Right. They're trying to keep the unit cost of serving an hour of video uh, within a certain range because their revenue coming in according to the number of subscribers and their costs going out according to the number of subscribers using their service. So if you can get to that point, uh, then the argument becomes, am I making money on this rather than why are you spending 100K? It's why are you spending a dollar per user when I'm only making a buck 50 per user? Mm -hmm. And that's a really big mental change. It's funny that you mentioned Pardon me? Sure. What's that? A, oh, I was going to say it's funny that you mentioned the auto scaling is a cost saving measure uh, because we actually, that, that's a nice side effect of the auto scaling for us, but the main reason we actually do it is for reliability purposes. Right. We, uh, we use it to make sure that we have enough resources available when we need them for the customers. And that actually kind of goes back to my original point about, you know, you've got to take advantage of the cloud. That's one of the big advantages is this auto scaling and sizing, right sizing for the workload right now. But this cost savings is a nice side effect of that. You see, I think that illustrates a lot of what's happening on the cloud right now. The people are using the cloud to do stuff they couldn't do internally. You couldn't grow like Netflix if you had to provision a regular uh, data center. Have I frozen? No, everyone's still still. And, and, uh, and then you turn to try and make it more efficient. So if there are cost savings to be had, then let's make that auto scale a little bit more efficient so we can get the unit costs down. But you kind of come back to the cost afterwards. Just make it work, then make it cheaper. Jeremy, is that your, your thought? I mean, what, what about cost containment? Is auto scaling is part of it. What else would you say about terms of managing costs? Uh, so for us, uh, we actually uh, wrote a tool to help us manage costs. It's, uh, it's called ICE. It's open source. Uh, and what it does is it actually sort of takes all the cost information and graphs it. Uh, and it's really helpful because what you can do is then look at those graphs and see where there are spikes of usage that you didn't expect. Uh, or you can see where all of your costs are going. And one of the other nice things that that tool does for us, because we also use Asgard, is it actually emails each application owner and lets them know what their costs were for the week and whether their growth or in cost was greater or less than the overall growth of Netflix's cost. So each, that gives each team the information they need to know whether they're growing faster or slower than the rest of Netflix. I, I missed part of that. Is that app available? Is that, is that an in-house app? Uh, yeah, it's on uh, it's on our uh, GitHub actually, uh, Netflix.github.com, uh, and it's called Ice. Anyone anyone can download. Oh yeah, Ice, of course. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and Bernard, I think it was something that Matt said that's kind of interesting. You're talking about costs. You know, decide whether it's a fixed cost or it's going to be uh, you know it's going to be variable. It seems like the the, the variable is going to be a better approach on a monthly basis. Agree, disagree, and what about the issue of costs in general? How do how do you contain them? Uh, well, there's a lot of different parts to that, but the yeah. first I think that Matt was sort of alluding to that I think it's really important for people to understand is the old model was you sort of guessed up front and said, how much do I need to buy? And you allocated right. a bunch of capital. And while that wasn't very satisfactory from an operational perspective, it was very attractive from a financial 
expected because you had very predictable costs, right? You had so much depreciation per month, you knew exactly what it was going to be. Today, by contrast, you have much less difficulty around the projection, you know, having to sort of predict ahead of time, and you can map what you use to what you require from a technical perspective. In other words, if I have twice as much volume, I can easily uh, put in twice as much capability and address that volume. The challenge is you get wild, you know, sort of variable bills, and um, from a financial perspective, that's disquieting because a lot of people, a lot of financial types, just love. I get fixed costs, and I, you know, kind of I can plug that into a spreadsheet plan. Right. Right. Um, more critically, I think, from uh, to address Matt's or to elaborate on Matt's point, is many of the kinds of uses that are being made of cloud computing now tend to be very directly business focused. In other words, they're associated with a business application or some kind of maybe a, a marketing campaign where you're really trying to accomplish some kind of um, ROI. You know, in other words, what does it cost me per lead? Or how much right. does it cost me to take an order? Or something like that. And all of a sudden, the cost of uh, executing that transaction is really critical. Because if your cost per lead, the value per lead is, say, six bucks, right? And if you only spend a dollar getting that lead, that's great. If you spend nine dollars in that, you're losing money in everyone, and so right. the cost of the underlying technology becomes a cost of goods sold. Right? It's a part of your cogs, which is absolutely crucial when it's really tied to a business outcome. So um, what now I was talking about was you have to be able to track and analyze and understand your costs associated with your cloud environment. Um, very closely so that you can map it into, am I getting true business value out of it? How do you do that with Amazon that in particular? What how, how do, how, how, what's that? I said I hope that goes along with what Matt was trying to say. <laughs> Absolutely, Bernard. You said it much more quickly and succinctly than I did. Well, I, I guess I, I totally I understand what you're saying, but how do, you, how do you do that specifically with Amazon, Bernard? Well, um, obviously, you should be using an a application like Cloudability. Oh. Um, <laughs> which, okay. um, I mean, Amazon is very good at telling you what you use, but it's very poor at helping you understand the implications, helping you understand what alternatives you might have, okay. predict what is going to come on. And there's a whole range of supporting kind of applications that come out, uh, much like uh, Matt's company, Cloudability, that help you do what uh, uh, usage, analytics, and cost analysis. And so, you know, it's really important to tie in the technical stuff to the financial stuff, and that's what uh, product like Cloudability. I mean, it's not the only one, but it's a good one. Uh, yes, but hope you do. Matt, you need to buy Bernard a drink and the good stuff too. None of that. Oh, none yeah. of that. You know, house Thank liquor, you, the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Paul, your sense on containing costs? What, what's your what's your view of of dollars down with Amazon Web Services? Okay, sure. Well, you know, I think the first thing. And it's been covered pretty well, but you know we have to understand that economics in the cloud is really different. You have a lot of flexibility there. You can move to a, a purely fixed cost environment, even in the cloud, or purely variable, or anything in between. So I think you got to understand those economics and then have the tools to support you. Amazon has some built-in tools and capabilities to give you visibility, but um, definitely consider this another vote for cloudability and tools like them because they give you. Uh, even deeper insights, and you start to begin to, to be able to compare even Amazon versus other clouds and that sort of thing. Maybe even do some some planning and preparation of your spending before you move into the cloud. So definitely look at the third-party tools. Any other third-party tools you'd mention in addition to cloudability, which we've established is a good one? Uh, yeah. What, what, what else might you look at in terms of? Um, let's see. There's there's Cloudin. Mm -hmm. um, there's Nuvum. Although Nuvum was just acquired by someone, so maybe someone can refresh my memory on who who acquired them. But um, yeah, Data Pipe. That's right. Data Pipe. Data Pipe. Okay. Right. Yeah. So those are all interesting those, ones. Those are third party tools. 